Okay. Uh, welcome, <laughs> all all of you <laughs> to uh, again. to GSC as usual. Um, just before we start today's session, I want to um quickly just go over a few announcements we got uh, that Anthony put out um today. So um just a couple of things next week uh we're taking a bit of a break uh the constant sessions are kind of frying me uh as i'm sure they are you so yeah we're taking a one week hiatus and then we're coming back on the 15th uh which is kind of insane that it's that close already uh for a session on demo reels I'm really excited about that one since it's getting a bit more into the business side of things but the uh, the big thing is on November 22nd, we're having a guest speaker, um, Rom DePrisco. He's a composer. He's coming in to enlighten us. Make sure you come out. Tell everybody you know. Tell your dog. Tell your cat. Uh, tell somebody you meet, like, in Starbucks or something. Everyone should come. It'll be great. It'll be super informative. Uh, last year he came out as well, and it, that was a great time. So, yeah, mark it in your calendars, and that'll cap off the year for GSC. So on the 29th, we're just going to be hanging out. It'll be a chill time, and, yeah, no session that day. So, yeah, the ROM one, that's going to be the last one for the year. Definitely come out. You do not want to miss it. All right, now, just hopping right into this session today, we're going to be looking at some of the basics of FMOD, and... I'm using the term basics very loosely for this because um, we're going to be covering everything from like the absolute basic building blocks to uh, just things you definitely will 100% need to know and need to know how to use. Uh, so let's hop right in and let's ask the question, why even use FMOD? Why even use middleware? Because we've talked about middleware a lot here but we haven't really discussed why it's so important really so we're just going to cover the foundations of that and why we're using it in the first place um so what even is middleware middleware on paper is software that integrates audio into the game engine you're using uh with a lot more complexity added to it behind the scenes but it's super easy to add it um and there's a variety of design features that enables this complexity and makes it super easy to use. Um, for FMOD in particular, it's really indie friendly um, and it's very student friendly. Uh, so for a beginner, it's great to learn. It's very similar to um, DAWs uh, in terms of the workflow. Um, and it's wide, widely used throughout the industry. So it's definitely something you want to look at. Um, the main alternative, uh, the kind of the big brother, is uh, WISE or WISE, however you want to say it, um, and that as well is middleware. Um, so, a couple good things about middleware: you can uh, take sound to the next level, uh, particularly through adaptive audio, and that includes obviously adaptive music as well. Uh, you can control properties using parameters or different settings. You can add uh, DSP effects, uh, which means digital signal process. Uh, they're basically just real-time effects like reverb, uh, flangers, compression, uh, equalization. Any effect that you would apply to an audio file, you can do that in real time in the middleware. Um, as well, you can au automate and modulate uh, settings and different properties based on parameters. Um, one amazing thing is that it's a lot less code, um, makes it easy for the programmers to work with the API, um, easy enough that even I'm able to inc integrate audio and, um, I don't really code. So if my team ever lets me do that, I'm actually able to do it, um, which is great. And that means that when I bug Anthony to add in footstep sounds, it's as simple as him adding a line. Thank you for your contribution to that. Um, so on the other side of things, there's a lot more freedom and creativity you, you have, uh, particularly as a sound designer. Um, it's a lot easier to prototype with than just code. Um, it's incredibly easy to mix uh, using live update, which we'll touch on at the end 
of today's session. And there's pretty much endless possibilities for what you can actually do with this, um, with its clear and easy to use um, UI. And like I said, FMOD in particular is very visually similar to a DAW, so it's something you'll probably already be familiar with the look of. And probably the most important thing is that it's very optimized. Um, and it's very easy to work with and to make it even more optimized for your project. So uh, FMOD, since we're going to be talking about that, uh, it has a profiler built into it that you can open up um, for performance data specific to audio. Uh, it compresses audio when you build it um, to save space in memory. Uh, and you can stream straight from the drive uh, to avoid loading it into memory. Although this does add a bit of latency, so it's usually best uh, left for music. But the point is, there are so many ways that optimize or FMOD optimizes uh, your audio and the way it works that you might as well just use it. So let's hop right in. So you open up FMOD, what do you see? You see this whole thing. Um, this will be the main place you'll be working. Uh, this is the primary window for FMOD um, Studio. And whenever you open up a new project, this is exactly what you'll see. Um, so just to kind of briefly go over the main sections of it, on the uh, right side, or on the left side um, of the window is the browser, uh, which is split into three different categories. There's the event browser, um, which houses all the events, lets you view and edit them. Uh, it's also got the banks. Uh, wow, my brain just stopped working. It's got the banks browser, which lets you browse banks, <laughs> as you'd expect, and then the assets browser. Um, basically, overall, the browser is where you'll be creating, importing, naming, and organizing all of your events, banks, and assets, respectively. Um, the middle part uh, is the editor. This is the main chunk of the window as you can tell so it's obviously the most important uh, it's got the timeline at the top um, and it's got all the playback controls uh, it's and that big gray box under it uh, that's where you'll edit the events so we're gonna look at that uh, in one of the next slides we're gonna put some stuff in it um, but basically this is where or this is what's used to view edit listen to uh, or audition events that you create and you can open more editor tabs by clicking the plus tab at the top. Um, and then you load an event just by clicking it. So you can open up a couple different events, play them all at the same time if you want, um, test different things, copy and paste between them, etc. On the uh, right side is the overview. Um, that's where you view properties um, and you can try out different positional data for 3D events. Um, and just hear how it goes from ear to ear, see how it sounds. Um, but also, it will list out the parameter properties as well. So whatever the parameter is set to, um, if it's used in this event, it'll be there. And last but not least, the bottom has the deck. Uh, this displays the properties of the current instrument, track, or parameter that you have selected, as well as its whole signal chain and effects, which once again, as you expect, since we're on slide like four, uh, this will be something we talk about later. So I keep saying the word event. What even are they? Uh, they're the main building blocks of FMOD. Uh, so in events, that's where you put um, your actual audio files. So you import something in the assets folder. You make a new event. You drag the asset audio file, whatever you want to call it, into the event and then you hit play, boom, that event now has a sound in it. Um, every sound you want uh, in your game should have an event corresponding to it. And there will be some events that have layers of tracks on it. So let's say one event has a couple of sound effects on it. Cool. But that one event is used for, say, a gunshot or a weird spell or something. Um, so you'll, for the purposes of this, you'll want to deal with timeline events, um, cause there are two types of events. There's action events and timeline events. Don't worry about action events. 
I haven't worried about them and they've it's got me this far. Um, so we'll probably talk about them at some point in the future, but not today. Timeline events essentially just make that actual timeline that you see in the editor window on the top picture. Um, so along with uh, action events and timeline events, there's two like subtypes of events. There's 3D and 2D ones. Um, the main difference is that uh, 3D events have a spatializer effect tossed on their master, um, which you can see at the bottom there. As you'd expect, the spatializer uh, puts the sound in a 3D space, um, and it allows them to be panned in the game world. 2D events do not have this, um, so as you could probably expect, all you really need to do um, is, like, if you want an event to be 3D but you messed up, you misclicked, you made it 2D, all you need to do is go to the master and then add a spatializer effect to it. Um, all you need to remember for this is that 3D events are for everything in the game world. So like footsteps, enemies making noises, uh, gunshots, explosions, level objects uh, that make ambient sounds, all that stuff. Uh, that's 3D. And then 2D events are things that you want to keep at the same level um, to the player at all times. So that's usually non-diegetic stuff. Um, so like music and UI sounds, uh, as well as narration but it can also include stuff like level-wide ambience and that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, last but not least about events, multiple events can be played at once, um, as you'd expect, so music and then you hear footsteps over top of it and then you hear someone talking over the footsteps over the music, that's great, but if you hear two people walking at the same time, you can call the same event multiple times and then it will just create a new instance of it. So that's basically how that works. All right, moving on to what events are made of, uh, assets and instruments. Um, so like I said, you import assets by uh, either dragging files into the asset browser or you just right click, click import, or you can go to file and then import assets. However you wanna do it, assets are um, basically just audio files that you then put into events. Um, but how do you put them in events? They are stored in things called instruments. Um, and there are four main types. Uh, there are single instruments, multi-instruments, event instruments, and scatterers. Um, just to quickly go through them all, uh, instruments are basically a fancy way of saying a thing that makes sound, um, aka an audio file. Um, but, uh, what they do is a single instrument holds one audio file, as you would expect. A multi-instrument can hold, uh, as many as you want, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is probably a hard limit, but I haven't hit it yet. <laughs> and I've used quite a few files in one multi-instrument before. Um, but essentially it's a playlist of instruments and you can shuffle them, you can randomize them or play them back sequ sequentially. Um, and yes, you can put multi-instruments inside multi-instruments if you wanna have some weird recursive thing going on. Um, but yeah, multi-instruments and single instruments are both incredibly useful. They're probably the two main things you're gonna be using. Um, and then two more that are slightly less common but still fairly uh, commonly used. You have event instruments which basically just hold another event. Um, so essentially you just drag an event out of the events browser, drop it into a project, or drop it into a different event, and then it will create either a nested event or a referenced event. Um, it's great for organization. Um, if you want to play the event uh, within another one and just kind of organize it that way, um, but you can also choose to cut it off at the end if you want. So it plays and then you hit the cut button and whenever it ends in the uh, current timeline, that's where the event will just cut off. Um, so that's one thing you can do with it. And uh, last but not least, the scatterer. Uh, this one is essentially just a multi-instrument, um, but it will randomize where and when the instruments are played uh, with the ability to adjust the frequency of it playing 
uh, the range of the distance, the maximum voices, so the amount of uh, instruments that can play at once, um, and a whole lot more. They are super useful, especially for ambience. Um, so in our game last year, Earthlight, we had a wetland level, and in that level I threw in a bunch of like frog sounds, some crickets, I just tossed a ton of them into a scatterer, um, so that as you're walking through, you hear like the wind blowing through the leaves, uh, you hear the footsteps and all that. Um, but along with the wind and natural ambience of the level, it would randomly make, like throw a cricket sound in there or like a frog croak. Um, so it can really add to the, well, ambience of a level, but it can also be used for things like music. It could be used for um, weapons if you want like let's say it's a beam of energy and then you want some like crackling every now and then you can use a scatterer for that to really randomize how it is um, but yeah scatterers are incredibly useful um, so along with all that each of them have uh, different trigger behavior settings um, mainly probability uh, lets you change the probability of the sound playing um, which you then adjust with the chance uh, slider. Um, polyphony, change, I probably just butchered that word, uh, changes the amount of uh, that event that can play at once, uh, with stealing being an option to let you choose uh, whether it keeps the current sound playing or if it steals from the last one. Um, so along with that, there's conditions. Uh, this is where things get really interesting. Um, allowing you to add parameters if you want. Um, and this will allow you to play uh, the sound depending on the event state uh, or anything you want, really. Um, and that is where a lot of the magic happens in FMOD. Um, that add condition button, you can do pretty much anything you want with parameters. Uh, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, along with the conditions, there's also uh, delay and quantization intervals that you can change. Um, and essentially what the quantization interval is, is that means it will play on the note or bar that you want, um, or the specific time you want with the delay. Um, so it's great for lining things up with the beat, uh, if you want to do that. Um, yeah, it's definitely something to look at. And uh, when you add instruments, you'll notice that there's a little button on them that says Async right beside the master volume. Uh, essentially, when you click that, or if you click that, the track will uh, start from the beginning no matter what, um, like no matter where the playback marker is. So let's say you're halfway, halfway through an event right in the middle of it, and then you hit play. If Async is, if async is on, uh, it will play that track from the beginning uh, and it doesn't matter that you started in the middle of it. But if synchronous is on, which it is by default, you go to the middle of the track and you hit play, it will start at the middle. Um, so both of them are super useful. Um, so use them as you will. All right, moving swiftly on to the logic track. Uh, this appears above all the other tracks in the editor. Um, and these basically just change how the playback of the track reacts uh, to changes over time. Uh, so this is usually done uh, with the help of parameters, which is something, one of the big ones we're going to touch on later. So there's a couple different types of markers that you'll see. Uh, so I'm just going to go through them uh, in that list. Uh, I forgot I threw that Among Us meme in there. I'm just going to look away from that. Uh, <laughs> so starting off, there's the tempo marker. Uh, you're going to want to use this for music. It is essential. Um, and this will set the tempo and time signature for everything to the right of it until the next tempo marker, where you can change it if you want. Um, basically, as you can see, it's got the tempo uh, and then the time signature. Um, by default, it is set to 120 and 44. Um, and whether you have a tempo signature or a tempo marker or not, that's what the default is. So if you want anything other than 120 uh, BPM and 44, then add a tempo marker and change it. Uh, destinations, uh, they will allow you to uh, set a spot in the uh, in the timeline that transitions can jump to. 
um, but it is essential for organizing, particularly with music. And they can be markers or regions. So I included both in that little image. Right below the tempo marker, there's marker A and region A. Uh, each of those basically do the same thing. Um, then you got three or two more types of regions. You got the loop and magnet regions. Uh, for the loop, once the time uh, marker hits the end of it, it will go back to the beginning of the loop, looping that section, as you'd expect. Uh, you can change the probability of it looping, and you can add conditions, um, set the quantization, or not set the quantization, sorry. Uh, but yeah, you can add conditions to trigger it using parameters. And uh, something that I didn't know for a while, you can double click them and rename them since they're basically just destination regions but with an added effect. Um, same thing with magnet regions, you can double click to name them, but what they do is they make the playback position jump to the beginning of the region uh, where the conditions are met. Um, if yeah, if the conditions are met. So let's say there's a magnet region on bar 54 and you're on bar 2 uh, and your parameter gets uh, changed from 0 to 1. 1 is the trigger. It will jump all the way to bar 54, the start of that magnet region, and then it will basically just loop because when it hits the end of the region, it won't be in the region anymore. It'll go back to the beginning. Um, so they're kind of like loops, except they're sticky. Um, but with these... Uh, you can change the probability, add conditions, and you can set the quantization of it. So let's say you're doing this for music, um, and you really want it to go to this one section when this parameter's hit. Um, you can do it on a certain beat with quantization. Uh, and then the two uh, most important ones, I would say, right beside the destination marker, um, are transitions. Um, basically, when a playback hits it, uh, if the conditions are met, the playback position will jump to wherever it's set to. Um, so in that image example, I have one set to marker A, one set to marker B, and you can also target regions with this. And yes, you can target loop and magnet regions as well. Um, so they're super versatile. You could do pretty much anything with them. Uh, and they also have probability and conditions uh, with the regions also having the addition of quantization intervals. Uh, these are one of the big essentials that you're going to want to know. And one thing that I literally have never used, I didn't know it existed until I was making this, uh, sustain points. <laughs> uh, basically, when the playback position hits that point and the conditions are met, it just stops there. Uh, and it will pause any synchronous of instrument that's playing, uh, but not asynchronous instruments. Um... And when it no longer meets the conditions or a cue is received, uh, it will just continue on like nothing happened. Um, and cues are basically just a command that says keep going. I didn't know those existed either because their only use is basically just for sustain points. Alright, getting this slide out of my way with the Among Us meme on it. Let's move on to a bit more about trigger conditions. Um, so, like I just touched on, transition markers, regions... Uh, magnet regions and loop regions all have these um, and all of them have different stuff uh, and like I said they only function if the conditions are met so for the and condition um, all the conditions must be met at the same time and with the or as you'd expect uh, we all have some familiarity with code um, in this program if and is set all of them needs to be hit if or is set just some of them, or one of them, needs to be hit, and it will trigger the transition. Um, once again, probability condition is there for random chance, um, which then you can adjust with the chance slider. Uh, but yeah, parameter conditions are the big one. Uh, this is where you can set them to a range or a specific label. Again, we're going to talk about parameters later, but just want to touch on them here, because uh, they kind of stick their toes in everything. Um, and yeah, transition regions and magnet regions can be quantized, um, and that's just on the bottom right there, so that'll only trigger them on specific notes or bars. Uh, one really neat thing about transitions, um, something that I don't really use, but I definitely should, are transition timelines. So, 
they're just kind of like a separate timeline between transitions uh, that it must go through uh, before the transition is complete. Um, so it's super useful for stingers to blend two tracks together if you're doing music. Um, and yeah, like I said, the playback must go through it. So you hit the transition, it will go through this transition timeline, which is kind of like a separate dimension. And then once it gets through that dimension, it'll go back to the normal timeline uh, to wherever it was being sent to. Um, so you add them by just right clicking on a thing and then clicking add transition timeline. And then once you added it, uh, you'll see that there's a little circle um, on the transition marker or whatever marker you're using. Um, and basically just double clicking that will open up the timeline for you. Um, and they can be added to transitions, um, both markers and regions, as well as loop and magnet regions as well. Um, but they do act a little differently uh, depending on what you use. Uh, so for transitions, it will uh, just transition to the marked location uh, from the current point. So you're going through the music, you hit the marker, the transition marker, it will go through the region, and then it will teleport you to the point. Uh, the loop, once you get to the end of the loop, uh, that's when it will uh, play the transition region. And once again with the magnet, once you hit the end of the loop, that's when it will play it. Alright, bit more fun stuff. Uh, signal chain and effects. Uh, this is where you can do a lot with adaptive audio, uh, not just with music. Um, and we'll touch on this one more time just at the end with the mixer, uh, but they are super useful. You can add the signal chain and effects to uh, tracks in the event, um, as well as buses in the mixer. Um, and there are two kind of places you can add them. There's pre-fader and post-fader effects. Um, and on the top right, as you can see, there's the big fader in the middle. That's basically just the overall track volume. So naturally, pre-fader means that it applies the effects, the effects uh, before the volume and then post fader is after the effects are applied. Um, effects are the same across all instances of an event. So you throw a compressor on, um, like let's say the footstep event, every single footstep will have that compressor, but if the values are controlled by a parameter, uh, each of those can be different. Um, and like I just kind of alluded to, parameters can be used to automate the values um, of effects. So this is where the adaptive stuff comes in. Uh, once again, just reiterating the spatializer effect is what makes an event 3D, and every 3D event has this on its master. Uh, but the one thing to keep in mind is that effects run in real time. So don't pile too many on. If you can uh, use them uh, like on the actual audio file before you put it in FMUD, make sure you do that. That'll save you a lot more processing power when you're running the game and it's trying to throw on like 45 effects at once. Um, but FMOD does have a pretty comprehensive list to choose from, so it is a little tempting to just s slap everything on because you easily could. All right, finally got to it. Parameters. You got instruments added. You slap some effects on them. Now you want to adjust it all. This is what you do it with. Um, you can pretty much right click almost any dial in FMOD uh, to add automation to it using a parameter. Um, and yeah, it allows you to modify pretty much everything uh, from the pitch of something uh, to the volume of an, an event or a track or even one audio file or instrument. Um, you can automate different parts of effects, pretty much anything. It's super useful, super versatile. Um, and with this versatility, there are three main types. There's the continuous parameter, uh, discrete, and labeled. Uh, basically, just going over these quickly, continuous parameters, they're floats within a range. Uh, so they're used for fine changes, like let's say your health at 0.45 or something like that. Um, that's what that would be used for. Um, then you have discrete parameters, which are integers in a range. So it's fixed increments like level one, level two, um, stuff like that. 
and then you got labeled parameters which are strings within a range so they're basically just integers but used for things that aren't used or don't have any real order or sequence to them uh, so one place I've used them is for uh, footstep sounds actually um, so like I would have one set for wood I would want to have one for metal grass all different environments that's where that would go um, so uh, with that there are th two different types of scope that a parameter can have you can either have local or global scope uh, local is each instance of it has its own value so you play two footstep sounds at the same time one of them is on one uh, thing one of them is on another thing uh, both of those can have different parameters uh, or different parameter values um, if they're local but if they're global I don't know why you would do this but if they were global for footsteps you're walking on grass but your buddy who has uh, player one is walking on metal your footsteps would be metal because all of them are metal um, so this one's pretty much necessary to automate things on the mixer uh, so that was a weird example of using it in that way but you probably wouldn't be using it that way anyways um, and one last really cool thing uh, parameters can be used to open up a new timeline as well uh, something I found really useful for those footstep sounds I was talking about um, and that sort of thing whenever you're using labeled parameters. Uh, so in them you can set things to play only when the parameter is set to that value. So here you can see under value A, uh, I have one multi-instrument, value B I have a scatter, and volume C I have a uh, single instrument. Um, just replace those with like a multi-instrument for footsteps on grass, multi-instrument for footsteps on metal, whatever surface you're on. Um, so this is super useful. Definitely take advantage of this. And uh, on kind of the same topic as uh, parameters, we got automation. Um, so this is basically just using parameters to automate changes in the event uh, or in the uh, um, for the value. So you can't really have parameters without automation, uh, but you cannot have automation without parameters. Um, so what you do is you right click a value, you add automation, and then you add a curve uh, based on the parameter you want to use. Um, so there in the bottom right, I have a really weird curve, but I really wanted to uh, exaggerate it <laughs> to show just what you could do if you really wanted to. Um, and essentially that means that as the value of that parameter uh, is changed, its position along the x-axis will change what the value is of this um, of the threshold which is what I automated um, but the cool thing is you can add multiple automation curves to one value so if I really wanted to I could throw on another parameter for the same for the same value so threshold um, like let's say uh, one parameter it's like okay is this checked off cool this will put out nothing and cool if it's zero then cool it outputs just something like that and then this weird one as well you can do that if you want to um, and they are essential for dynamic audio like I said you can't really use parameters without automating stuff um, so you're definitely going to want to use it and uh, along with that bottom right view there's also the view in the bottom left which is on the timeline, they are collapsible tracks under the track that you slapped them on. Um, and yeah, that's where they'll be. Next up, we got something kind of similar. Um, we got modulation. So it's super useful, um, but I haven't found too much use for it um, beyond one type of them, which we'll talk about. Um, but basically all it does is it changes the value over time. Uh, and the type of modulator that you use varies how it does this pretty drastically. Uh, so there are four types. There are random modulators, uh, which just fluctuates the value randomly within a region. Um, there's AHDSR, which is the one I love. Um, what that stands for is attack, which is the start of the event or sound hold 
that holds the peak value for a certain time after the attack. Uh, the decay, which is the drop off of the peak value. Uh, the sustain, uh, the next value it just holds on to. And then the release, which is the end of the event or sound. Um, the really cool thing about this is that it allows for fading out sounds when you trigger them. Um, and when you... So when you're playing something in FMOD, uh, if you just hit stop normally, it will just stop it, like, abruptly in the middle of the sound. But throw one of these bad boys on it, you hit stop, it'll fade out the sound. So it can make it sound a lot more natural, really useful. Um, in case of volume, which you'll primarily be using this on, uh, the initial uh, value, the peak, the uh, sustain, and final values they will all be in decibels, but irregardless of whatever property you modulate, the attack, hold, decay, and release will all be uh, in milliseconds or seconds. Uh, the third one is the LFO. Uh, that's basically just using a wave to change the value. Uh, so you can use either a sine wave, a square, triangle, saw waves, and different types of noise for this. Um, and you can change the rate of it, you can change the phase, the depth of it, and you can also sync it to uh, the beat and tempo if you wanted to. Um, and last but not least, you have sidechain, which you can modulate based onto a sidechain. So, uh, just kind of a refresher on what sidechaining is from last week. One track or channel makes noise, so you put a sidechain on it. Um, that gets used then as the input to determine how the sidechain uh, will react based on the threshold. So let's say you have uh, footsteps with a sidechain on it um, that gets sent here. Um, every time there's a footstep, it will say drop the threshold or drop the volume or something like that. Um, so one of the really cool things is that you can actually modulate or you can take modulator values and automate them. Uh, so basically what that means is you can take the attack and you can change it based on a parameter or you can take the randomness um, of the fluctuation and change that based on a parameter. So this is what I mean. You can do pretty much anything with automation and modulation. So it is incredibly useful. Um, it's really just amazing that we can do this, to be completely honest. But yeah, game sound is cool. All right, moving on, uh, getting closer to the end here, um, but this is one of the last big things um, that you really need to know in order to use FMOD, uh, and that's banks. So banks are essentially just a collection of events for use in the game engine, um, and then eventually the game. Um, and they're kind of just like modular chunks of your audio that you load in, so let's say you only want um, sounds for this enemy in at this time because you're not in this level, you're not using this enemy, you're just using this guy. So then you can load a bank for that enemy and instead of loading like an enemy bank that has everything, you save a ton of space uh, in memory. Um, so there's two different types. <laughs> Again, I... I feel like half of the sessions I do is just me saying there are blank types of this, uh, but there are two types of banks that you'll see. There are master banks and just normal banks. Um, the master bank is something that's always loaded into memory. Uh, it contains the data for pretty much everything. Um, do not stick events in there unless you only have like two events in your game and they're always loaded into memory. Uh, Cause like I said, this is always loaded into memory. If you put all your banks in there, that'll load up your RAM pretty quick. Um, so that's what master banks are do, or that's what master banks do. Um, and then beyond that, you have just the normal bank files, which have uh, pretty much everything from audio files to events, effects, mixed data, parameters, everything. Um, so that's where you assign events into. And how you do that is you go into the events browser in the main editor, uh, you right click assign, or you right click an event, click assign to bank, and then you click the bank you want to assign it to. Um, and then in the banks browser, you can see that under it, 
is the event. Um, and then let's say you're moving it into Unity or whatever your engine is. Uh, then you need to click F7 or go under File and click Build. This will build the banks into a folder. 99% um, of the time, it'll be under a folder called Desktop because that's just the platform you, the default is. Um, but yeah, that's where it is. And then, boom, you drag those out, stick them in, and everything should be working. Um, yeah, and for those of you who are in second year, uh, just one thing I really want to say, because uh, I know we struggled with this a little bit back in second year, um, but for those of you making your own engines, uh, the master bank needs to be loaded into memory first, no matter what. Uh, so let's say you want to play one sound, you can't do that until the master bank is loaded in. So you do master bank loaded, and then you load in the bank that that event is under, and then you play the event. And that should work. And last but not least, we got the mixer window. This is something I did not know existed until uh, last year, um, which I'm sure everyone on my team is thankful that I found this because the mix for Primordial was non-existent. It was horrible. Everything was way too loud. And now I know how to turn the volume down. And this is where you do that. Um, Essentially, what the mixer window is, is it's the event editor, but for mixing. So it takes the master track of each event uh, and routes them into the master track or whatever uh, bus um, you want to put them into. So there are four major sections. There's the browser on the left again, uh, but as you can see, it looks a little bit different here. Uh, the default one and the main one that you're going to be using is the routing browser. This will allow you to view and edit a project's um, bus and event routing. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, there's the VCAs browser, um, which allows you to make and edit VCAs. What are VCAs, you might ask? I didn't know until literally an hour ago, but they take multiple channels and you can adjust their volume with one slider. They are basically just subgroups without the ability to add events and or effects and stuff to them. Uh, so the neat thing about them is that they could be used to control the volume of buses that are uh, not connected at all. So let's say you have all the all the events or all the buses for one, uh, yeah, all the buses for one level under one like big level two bus. Um, if you want to take all of the enemy sounds across all the levels and route them into one VCA to adjust the volume of them all there. That's how you do that. Um, so they're kind of like a group of groups, but not really. And lastly, we got the Snapshots browser. They are basically uh, an instanceable uh, unit of changes to the project's mix that you can trigger and control like an event. Uh, so. As you'd expect by the name, they're a snapshot of the game's mix. Um, so let's say you want to change the mix for whatever reason, you can swap out events, or you can swap out snapshots like they were events uh, in the game. Um, just to try out different mixes if you want. Then in the middle, replacing the event editor, you got the mixing desk. Um, this is where you'll be doing all the mixing, as you'd expect. Uh, if there's any 3D event in your project, you will see a reverb bus in here already. Um, but this is where any uh, buses that you make get sent in. And on the right, you got the uh, overview again, but right below it is the ever important master bus. This is the master gain slider for the project and thus the entire game. Uh, usually you don't want to mess with this too much. Um, it's mainly just there for monitoring reasons, um, but you could add effects to it if you want to like bit crush all the audio for your game for some reason. Um, you could do that on the master if you don't want to just do it all manually, um, or you change art styles halfway through development and don't want to go through and fix everything, you can toss something on there. Or you could be dumb and throw a delay on it and a bunch of reverb or like a distortion and make everything chaos but once again you can automate this stuff you can slap parameters in there you can do a lot of things so you could do some really cool stuff with that 
um, moving on, a bit of a closer look at the mixer window um, and just how you use it. Uh, events, this is where we're starting. We're starting with events. Uh, they have a bunch of tracks, uh, but each of them has a master track that is a submix of all the tracks in that event. All of the, so you have an audio file that is like one file. You have two of them on one event. Both of those get mixed down. Those get sent to the master track. The master track will represent the event here in the mixer. Uh, so when you see new event here, that is basically the master track for new event. Um, so you then organize those into groups, which creates a submix of all the events in that group. Uh, so it's taking all the master tracks of each event and then mixing those down into one like big master track, essentially. And then, one more time, each of those groups is then eventually routed to the master bus, which creates the final submix you will hear in-game. Um, so, the master track of each event is sent here, and then each of those master tracks get sent into groups, groups sent master track, or master bus. Um, so, there are two types of bus that things get sent to. Uh, there's the group bus, which is the main one you're going to be using. Um, you route events into these to organize them, um, and then it creates a submix of all of those signals. Uh, you can slap effects and a signal chain onto it if you want to, um, and if you really want to, you can put them into another group bus, which would then route it into that group. So as an example here, I put um, new group 2 and group 3. I routed those into new group 1. Uh, the word group does not look like a word anymore. Um, but yeah, two and three get routed into one. One gets routed into the master. And then four is separate, uh, routing into master. Um, so it's great for organization. Um, definitely something to look into. And alongside that, you have uh, return buses, which uh, cannot be um, used to route events or other buses into, uh, instead receiving signals from sends. Uh, so think of this as a sidechain. Um, and like I said, there's a return bus that's always in there. Uh, if you have a 3D, um, yeah, if you have 3D sounds, there is a return reverb bus. Um, this is just because the spatializers do that. And you'll probably notice there is a spatializer on the master bus, if I'm not mistaken. I'm doing this from memory right now, so I think there is, uh, but the return reverb there, that's essentially just 3D space reverb. Um, so yeah, like I said, you can add effects to things, you can add automation and modulation to all these, um, just to really spice things up. Um, and like I kind of touched on last week with one of the examples, um, you can use uh, a compressor on one bus and then sidechain another bus to make some really cool sidechain compression uh, things happen and you can do that with pretty much anything super useful um, like I said I don't know how I didn't know about this until last year but I don't want anyone else to make that mistake so here you go and last but not least at all uh, this can be used with live update to mix um, so right at the bottom right corner of FMOD, you will see a little thing that says Live Update. It is super sick. Basically what it does is it links to your engine. Um, so Unity, uh, your like actual engine, if you're in second year, it can link to Unreal, whatever you're using. Uh, it will link to that using uh, networking. And then you can mix as you play the game. So it is beyond helpful. It is a godsend um, to use this. Um, so 100% take advantage of that, especially if you're using Unity. Take advantage of it. Um, your mix will thank you. Your teammates will thank you, um, as I'm sure mine have, uh, for having a mix that doesn't blow out your eardrums. But uh, that's the mixer window. And thank you for sticking around. Uh, this one was pretty dense. Uh, my throat is starting to close. Uh, so thanks for sticking around. Um, 
make sure you always check out the uh, FMOD Studio user manual and documentation for anything else you want to learn. Because, um, like, I've been doing this for two, two and a half years almost, and I learn something new pretty much every time I look at it. Um, and there's also the quick start guide on the FMOD website. Uh, that's super useful for beginners as well. Um, so if you've been coming here, you haven't really gotten started, uh, gotten your hands dirty yet, that is a fantastic place to start. Um, it'll walk you through a lot of basics, as you'd expect. Uh, for being the quick start guide, it will get you up to speed fairly quickly. And yeah, next week, like I said at the beginning, we're taking a bit of a break, but the week after that, uh, we're going to be talking about demo reels, and the big one the week after that, on the 29th, we are having the excellent Rom DePrisco come in uh, to enlighten us. So once again, make sure you're there. We'll keep spamming announcements. Hamraj is probably going to annoy y'all at G GDSA. I'm going to make Anthony do the same at GPC. Uh, I'll probably yell at Druva about da or GAC. <laughs> um, so yeah, make sure you're there. It's going to be awesome. And yeah, thanks for coming out.